Guten Tag, my name is Randy Sharp. A welcome in im dinner party tonight. Today we're going to be making a sort of seasonal holiday-ish type meal that you can adapt and add to in any way you'd like. We're going to make the last of the summer vegetables, pickles, quick pickle. I know we made pickles in episode one, I think it was, but these are a little bit different. And we're gonna make a very retro, awesome thing called Ritz Cracker Canapes. Don't laugh, they're awesome. Then we're gonna make a luscious duck with cherry sauce. We're gonna make the only mashed potato dish you can make in advance called Duchess Potatoes. You will plots. And we're just gonna make a very simple broccoli rabe. And then for dessert, we're just gonna do lace cookies. Little lacy cookies that you can put in ice cream or you can just serve them as a light dessert for your guests during the holiday season. Let's talk about disasters, okay? Everybody has them in the kitchen. I'm not talking about something that you could cover up and continue. I'm talking about an earth-shattering, evening-destroying, life-questioning disaster. This Thanksgiving, I invited my guests for 4.30. This is an example of a disaster. At 4.50, 20 minutes, everybody's there, champagne, blah, blah, blah. Leonard has an allergic reaction. And I spent all of Thanksgiving in the emergency vet, three and a half hours. But the actual meal that we're making today was a disaster meal that I made for two friends that I literally reached over and took off their plates with my hands and threw it in the garbage. So we're gonna talk about other ways of dealing with disasters as opposed to reaching over and taking the food off your friend's plates and throwing it in the garbage. I forgot a very important detail. During prep day, the big prep day, which is Wednesday, it's prep, basically it's four days prep if you're doing Thanksgiving for 11 people that I wasn't present for because I was at the emergency vet. During prep day, uh, I'm working in the kitchen and I go downstairs to put some stuff in the dryer and I hear this sound. Blip, 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 blip. And there's water all over the floor pouring out of the ceiling the day before Thanksgiving at about 3 p.m., okay? Water is pouring out of the ceiling, pouring. This sprayer thing from the sink broke, okay? So it was basically, every time I turned it on, it was shooting water down into the basement. So, I mean, you have to kind of roll with this stuff. We shoved all these towels in the ceiling. It was this much water in the ceiling. And we called this plumber guy, Robert from Star City's Plumber, the best plumber in New York City. The guy came over here in under one hour and figured out what it was. We thought we had a burst pipe. So, you know, you have to kind of roll and laugh a little bit, but we're gonna talk about ones that aren't so funny that make you sort of question whether you should stay on the planet because that does happen in the kitchen. Quick pickles, they're delightful. You can make them all year from stuff that you find at the grocery store. You really serve them the same day. They're not like pickles that you use the hot water and all that nonsense. You actually never have to make those pickles again unless you like them. But you can also buy this stuff called pickle crisp granules from Ball, the guys who make the uh, jars. And it's some kind of chemical that's in all pickles. Calcium chloride, it's a kind of salt that keeps like cucumbers and stuff are crispy in the pickle. But it's kind of pointless to show you this because we're doing a quick pickle, which means you're gonna eat it the same day. But if you should make the other kind of pickles, buy this stuff because it keeps it crisp. Ah! So what we're gonna do is find some cute vegetables like this. Like these are very sweet and cute, very tiny and nice. Or green beans, which are very good for dogs, by the way. Even though Leonard wouldn't touch it with a 30 foot barge ball. I like to leave the tops. We clean them like this. If you need to, you can look at roasted carrots. I'll show you how to clean them. Cute, a little bit thick. So I'm just gonna take a knife and try to cut it down the center. Now that one I did nicely. Put it in a jar. Oh my God, it's so easy. And these, you pickle these in the morning of your party and then you're gonna serve them 
take them out of the water and sort of put them on a plate, you know, in a cute way. You can sprinkle that. I think I posted on Instagram that you can sprinkle that Japanese togarishi stuff. It's awesome. It's kind of red sprinkles on a little rectangular plate. Nice, fresh pickles. These are um, very nice carrots that I found at uh, Citarella because guess what? Gourmet Garage closed. Everybody who lives in New York, Gourmet Garage closed on 7th Avenue, mourned by the neighborhood. Right, Reggie? Right, Lenny? Yes, we used to get salads there and all kinds of stuff. I hope you all listened to Alice's Restaurant on uh, Thanksgiving while I was at the emergency vet. <laughs> You're supposed to listen to it at noon. He does say a bad word, but you have to forgive him because it was the, you know, it was the seven, it was the really the late 60s, and he may not have known another word for it. Um, so here are some green beans. These green beans that I've cut, they came cleaned from the grocery store. So I clean them and then I cut them in little batons like this. I'm just gonna put them in the jar. Anybody can do this. And it's a super cute uh, little addition to your hors d'oeuvre area. They should quick pickle for about an hour is the minimum. Two hours is great, the day is great. Dill, here's the problem with dill. They sell it in bunches that imply you are making four gallons of pickles, okay? Here's a little trick. Go to the grocery store, and as you walk by, just take a tiny little piece of dill and put it in your pocket. Because that's all you're gonna need. That's what you need. And they make you buy a huge bunch like this. So here we go. This is washed dill, putting this in. Did I mention that I had to leave Thanksgiving with 11 guests and all the food not ready? Three and a half hours, emergency vet. He's totally fine. Salt. Use your good salt for this. Malden salt. In my case, you might have another favorite. Pretty fair amount of salt. You're gonna taste this, so don't worry. And it does melt, you don't have to heat it up. It's like a brine. People go so berserk with that. It's like you don't have to heat brine, everybody, okay? The salt dissolves. This is rice vinegar, not seasoned. The seasoned one, you didn't season it, so I'm not sure why you would use it. This is not Kikoman, even though they imitate the logo. Kikoman is a fascinating company. There's actually a great documentary about them. It's run by a woman. So about halfway with that, and then I have some very cold water here, and about up to the top with water, but I'm still gonna taste it. A lot of comments about the spoons on uh, YouTube. <laughs> so here we go. It's very sharp. So I'm gonna put a little more water and I'm gonna put a tiny amount of sugar in, okay? So sort of like this amount. You wanna make it so it tastes like pickle juice. It's good. Now, what else can I put in? Celery seed, which I don't have, is excellent. The tops of celery, you know, the leafy parts of celery, that's really good. This is black mustard seed. They make like a nice color, sort of. You can put in couple slices of shallot if you want. La la la, making pickles for the people, pickles for the people. It's pretty sharp. If you guys weren't here, I would probably dump a little bit of this and put more water in. So let's pretend you're not here. I made a mistake. There you go. Disaster averted. There, a little bit more sugar, a little bit more salt. You're basically doing it by taste, okay? Here we go. Perfection. You're gonna seal your jar and put it in the refrigerator. It should look pretty, you know? Like you want it to have an appearance. Don't worry about the, the sugar in the bottom, it'll dissolve. Quick pickle, ding. If you're making broccoli, your broccoli rob in your dinner today, or if you're making broccoli rob just for the hell of it, when you're cleaning the vegetables for pickling is a good time to clean broccoli rob. This is a very strong stem. I would suggest later on when you actually cut it, that you cut it like that, okay? Because the stem is brutal. Broccoli rob is sort of a bitter foil to any 
unctuous meal because it, it has a bitter bitterness, which is a good thing. Here's the broken sprayer that flooded the basement. Basically, you just wash it. And what I would do is cut, cut it like this and then put it in a second bowl for, for when you use it. That's the amount of stem. Honestly, guys, that's gonna be hard to cook down. And by the time this is cooked down, this is gonna be dead. Broccoli rub, cleaning, it's a job. Don't sob. We're gonna make lace cookies. This is not the recipe that I normally use, so it could work or it could not work. I don't really know. We're gonna try it out. Lace cookies are cute. They're also, um, they're delicate. And if you do it fast enough, you can mold them into, into tubes because they're bendable, they're pliable, or you can lay them over a wine bottle and they make like a twill. I don't know if th this recipe will, but that's what they do. So we have some flour. It's on King Arthur flour and ro uh, oatmeal and sugar, okay? And then I'm supposed to beat an egg into this bowl with vanilla. As you know from watching Dinner Party Tonight, this is simply vanilla essence with the vanilla bean in, in it. I don't know how much you're supposed to use. So I'm beating that. Mix in the dry ingredients into this melted butter, which I've melted, which is a stick of melted butter. Looks like too much butter to me, but we're gonna check it out. Here we go. <laughs> Will it work? Nobody knows. Will it work? We'll see how it goes. Will it work? We'll see how the cookies go. Will it work? Nobody knows. And then I'm, I'm supposed to put this in, I guess. Blend it in, so here we go. This looks like it might make a lace cookie. It seems a, a touch dry to me. So I'm mixing it in the saucepan that I melted the butter in, King Arthur flour recipe. So it's, it's, it'll probably work, but we'll see. Smells good. So these will spread out like mad, okay? So when you put them on here, leave a lot of room in between the cookies because they spread out and make lace cookies. I'm gonna start with something like that, okay? I'm serious, leave this amount of room. You can kind of shape them into a sort of a circle if you want, but it's cute if they're uneven also. Your oven is heated to <laughs> the wrong temperature. Sorry. <laughs> That's funny. It's supposed to be 375, a little hotter than normal baking. And we're basically going to keep an eye on them because they will spread and cook very quickly. King Arthur says, yeah, it's five to seven minutes, so you want to keep a real eye on them. That's kind of what they look like. I'm skeptical, but let's see. Okay, I'm taking these out. They look like lace cookies. I don't know, we'll see. Uh, the trick with these, and it is important, is that you cannot let them cool for too long because they will be irreparably stuck. Hold on, but they have to cool a little bit or you can't get a, a spatula under them. It's not a cookie, okay. So you could have a problem here. Okay, this is like batch four because in the spirit of disasters, the first three batches we did went into one huge pancake, not separate cookies. So I used a tiny amount of batter and they spread out quite a bit. They spread out quite a bit, but not as badly as the first ones. Okay, so wait until you can move them with the spatula and then move them onto a rack because they will stick. This is a Silpat, but if you're using parchment paper, you, you gotta get them off of there before they cool because if they cool, they will mind meld with the parchment paper. So let these cool for a minute, and then we're gonna put them on a rack. Oops. You can stick these in ice cream, dink, 
I would store them very gingerly because uh, they're quite fragile. But in the spirit of saying the word ginger, you can actually add small flavorings to these. A little bit of almond uh, essence, a tiny bit of ginger in the batter, just to you know spruce them up. You can even put tiny pieces of chopped dried fruit. I've done that and it's great. But really it's just a simple lace cookie that goes with coffee, ice cream, whatever you'd like. Lace cookie. Check it out. I'm about to change your life, okay? This is without question the easiest appetizer in the world. It's nostalgic and it is completely delicious. I've now made this five times since I thought of it again. Obviously I knew about it. The secret to this is Ritz crackers. Remember these? If you think about a Ritz cracker, just like a Cheez-It is the same thing. These are actually exquisite crackers. The next time you eat a Cheez-It also, think about how magic a Cheez-It is and how hard it is to make that. Ritz crackers are the same way. And somebody invented a, an idea to make Ritz cracker canapes, okay? What, this is what you do. You open the pack of Ritz crackers. You can do this, uh, depending on your topping, you can do this way in advance, or if you have a very uh, moist topping, you don't want to do it in advance because um, it'll moisten the cracker. So you take a Ritz cracker and eat it. You get the Ritz cracker. You can do this any way you want. This is how I did it. I did this for Thanksgiving. Did I mention that I wasn't present? I was at the emergency vet. And the answer is, they don't know what it was, but his face swelled up like a basketball. It was horrifying. And you're gonna put a small, I have clean hands. You're gonna put a small amount of cream cheese on it, like that. That's actually a lot. And you put another little bit of cream cheese. Now just follow me. You also use a little bit of mayonnaise. So a little squirt of mayonnaise, blip, blip. I used, this is manchego. So you're gonna cut a, um, a kind of a sliver of manchego, like this, right? Like these size. You're gonna put it on top of your Ritz cracker and press down. So put the cheese on. I'm telling you, these are gonna change your life. And then you kind of press down on the cheese to make it a little more uniform. Okay, that's okay, but it could look better. So what I do, is I use hot pepper jelly that I made from, uh, hot pep, this is used, sorry, but um, that I made from chilies from my house, which is so awesome. But uh, you can use anything. You can use a slice of quick pickle. You can use a slice of a gherkin that you bought that has those cool little plastic things where you can pull the gherkins up. You can use nothing. You can put pepper. You can put a little piece of smoked fish on this. I'm telling you, it's the most versatile thing you've ever experience in your life. I think this is very festive. So I just put a little bit of hot pepper jelly like that and it's cute. So it's a nostalgic cute thing. Is there a problem with this? Can somebody tell me is there a problem with a Ritz cracker canapé? Comes out. Look at that. Don't bite it. Put it in your mouth all at once like this. I don't know what to say. That's fantastic. I love it to bits, a Ritz. We're going to make duck. Duck. It's a duck. With that beautiful crispy duck, Szechuan pepper duck, we're going to make a traditional sort of fancy sauce called a gastric, which is really just a sweet and sour sauce, essentially sweet and bitter sauce. For things like duck, it's good to use a sort of a fruit-based sauce. And in this case, we're gonna do cherries and blackberries and shallots and vinegar, and we're gonna bring it down to a wonderful sort of coating consistency, which we'll talk about more when I do it. But this is super easy. Don't be afraid to make a sauce. It's a sauce with pieces of fruit in it. It's not super refined and it's very easy. So let's go ahead and make duck sauce. To make duck sauce, you need some fruit, and a small dog. Like all great things in life, it's going to start with olive oil and shallots. So you're gonna heat up your pan. 
hot pan, olive oil. And you're gonna throw in some shallots. You're just gonna saute these down. I'm gonna put a little bit of salt for no reason. And this is, uh, you know, duck a l'orange that everybody says, oh, duck a l'orange is so fancy. The French will tell you they had nothing to do with that. You know, there's some people who use um, orange soda to make duck a l'orange. Chew on that. Sour cherries are great if you want to use, if you can find them. But I'm going to use a combination of blackberries and cherries. So the next thing I'm going to do, once these have sweated a little bit, is I'm going to pour this in. And it's going to sort of deglaze the pan slightly. I'm going to turn this down. And you want to cook the cherries and the blackberries for just a little, these are washed. You want to just cook that for a little bit with, before you add any more liquid. Gastrique is a snooty term, but it kind of sounds like that flavor. Gastrique, gastrique. It's sweet and vinegary, gastrique. It's, it works phonetically, but don't use it because you'll sound like a chef snob. So I'm just sort of cooking this for a little bit until they start to release a little bit of their juice. Now this is kind of starting to soften and release its juice. So I'm gonna now put in some vinegar. About half a cup of vinegar. Now, at Thanksgiving, which I don't know if I mentioned I wasn't present for, they, um, they opened a bottle of this, which is superb champagne, and they didn't finish it. So I'm gonna use this as white wine, but you can use any wine, any white wine. And don't um, ever cook with wine that you wouldn't drink. If you wouldn't drink it, you shouldn't cook with it. I'm gonna put a little bit of this Biacart Salmon Rosé Champagne in. Okay, so this is um, sugar. So I'm making, I'm sort of making a loose jam, essentially. So I'm, once it's nice and nasty, I'm gonna put the sugar in. I estimated the amount of sugar. And it should look a little bit like this before you reduce it. Okay, now I'm gonna taste it. It's really good. I'm gonna put a little more vinegar because I want it to be a little bit more sharp and a little bit of wine. Um, so then it should be quite loose and we're gonna reduce it. You want it to be on a fairly vigorous agitation because otherwise it's never gonna reduce. It's just gonna stew, okay? So you want it to be kind of boiling, but then you have to keep your eye on it because it's gonna reduce, which simply means the, the water in the solution is gonna evaporate and you want it to be, to use a fancy chef word, at the nap, N-A-P-P-E, which is when, if you put in a spoon, it will solidly coat the back of the spoon. The time I made this dinner before, when it was a complete failure, one of the failures was that I wasn't paying attention and I over-reduced the sauce and it burnt. And remember, it's gonna be thinner hot than it is at room temperature. And you can, you can always correct it. You can always add a little liquid, and then you'll have this fancy, fancy sauce to go with your duck. So one of the ways that you can tell that it's reaching nap is if you notice the difference between the way the bubbles are breaking. The bubbles are breaking more slowly now. They take longer to break. See that one? It's taking a long time to break. It's coating the spoon and staying on there pretty much. I'm gonna let it go for one second longer. What happened in uh, the disaster dinner was I took my eyes off it and it reduced down to tar, essentially, and smoked. I mean, it was really amazing, like amateur hour. But you know, that's the thing, is that all skills that you have are gonna put you in your place someday. They're gonna smack you down. Like something that you're really confident you can do is gonna smack, give you a smackdown. And that's when you grow as an artist or as a cook or as a mom or as anything. I don't know anything about mom because I don't have any kids. But that's when you grow. Anybody can do it when it's easy. When you don't have a disaster, anybody can cook a dinner party. It's when you have a disaster and you can process that smackdown and proceed to success. That's when you grow. So one of my advice is, you can be upset for that whole day, okay? You can let yourself be upset. You can, you can really get upset, but only for one day, 
okay? Then you have to start processing it and put it, putting your life back together. This is done, I've decided. But the awesome thing about a sauce that I'm making ever so slightly before is that I can continue to reduce it if I need to. Now it's quite thick and it's boiling hot. So I'm gonna see what happens when it cools a little bit. My suspicion is it will thicken quite substantially. If not, I'll reduce it again. I would take it to this consistency before you leave it, however. You know, a spoon's not gonna stand up in it, but it's essentially a sauce already. I wouldn't put this in the refrigerator because it'll turn into a rock, but you can always, you can always loosen it. So you can make this the morning of your duck dinner if you'd like and leave it on the stove. You just don't want it to get rock hard, said the actress to the bishop. Cherry sauce with blackberries, might I add, and be a card salmon champagne, reason unknown. Duchess potatoes. It's a little nostalgic, but it's gonna change your life because it is the only mashed potato recipe that you can make in advance. And it turns into a sort of potato souffle thing. I don't know how it works, but it's absolutely stunning. So what I did was I boiled some russet potatoes until they're completely soft. And then I peeled them. I'm gonna just peel one. So this was, I was looking up like potato recipes kind of. This is useless because it's so, so soft. I'm just gonna peel it quickly like this. And um, I found this recipe and I was like, oh yeah, I remember Dutch's potatoes. Okay, so these are peeled. So look at them for any brown spots or black spots. So we're gonna use this, which is a ricer. It's basically a potato masher. And you can change the, which I didn't know at Thanksgiving, <laughs> that you can change the grating. So I was pushing it through the smallest grating, which is actually fine for this dish, which is that grating. Um, actually, I think I'm gonna do that today. Cut your potato in half, and you can do this all in the same bowl. You put the potato in the ricer, flip the thing down, and press it. <laughs> and it comes out like that. Okay, scoop that off. The ricer is, it, it makes it really fine, but I um, hurt my arm doing this before Thanksgiving. Did I mention I wasn't here for Thanksgiving? You could make this with the skins on, but it's, it's a kind of a refined dish. It's a little better if it's all white than if it has, but you could do it with the skins on. Here are riced potatoes. They're, they're very uh, fluffy already, so that's a good sign. What we're gonna do is basically mix this all in the same bowl. I'm gonna put my five egg yolks in here. I think we did uh, egg separating already, right? This is what Makes it fluff up, I think. I don't know. I don't know how it works, but man, does it work. One and a quarter cups of heavy cream. Some melted butter. I didn't say it was calorie free. We want some salt in there. And about three quarters of a cup of sour cream. This is the recipe recipe. I think you could put anything in here that you want. So I like to put in a little bit of mixed herbs from my garden that I dried in a dehumidifier that Reggie or Brian gave me. Brian gave it to me. So these are from the garden. So I'm gonna put a little bit into the liquid ingredients. It makes it a little more fall-like, you know. Mix this all together. Okay, I'm gonna put a little bit of pepper in here. Okay, then you're literally gonna pour this in to the potatoes and mix it together and put it in a dish. You're done. And the amazing thing is you can make this on Christmas Eve and you can put it in the refrigerator. You can leave it overnight and then you can crisp the top the following morning. So the pan that I'm putting it in now is the pan that we're gonna serve it in. So you wanna have consciousness of that when you select your pan. So it's kind of thick. This will completely blow your friends' minds. You can't figure out what it is. If it's a potato souffle or what is it? It's as light as air. Light as a feather, fast as, what is that? Stiff as a board. Stiff as a board, that's right. I used to get scared the crap out of me when I was a kid and 
the girls would want to do um, levitation and stuff like that. I don't believe in any of that shit, but it was creepy. You, you remember that, ladies? I don't, I don't think boys did <laughs> levitation. <laughs> okay, now, the other thing you can do with Dutch's potatoes, if you're super ambitious, is you can put it in a pastry bag and pipe little sort of meringues of it and it will crisp up into a beautiful thing. I'm just gonna taste this. Oh, it has raw eggs, don't taste it. Trust me, you're gonna be fine. Make sure it's seasoned. Delicious. Could use a tiny bit more salt. Put a little more pepper. What they want you to do in France is make a design on the top, okay? Don't be afraid. You can do it. So what, what you do is you just take your spoon and you make a scallop design on top. See what I'm doing? And then when it crisps, it has a cute design on it. You can put these in any kind of tray that you want. Just remember the tray that you serve them in is the tray that you're baking them in. So in this case, I'm using this lovely copper pan. You can use a ceramic, you know, baking tray, but don't use like a cooking thing because you're not gonna take them out after you brown them. Believe me, you can put this in the refrigerator and you can cook it the next day and it will be superb. So this is basically cooked except for the eggs, okay? So when you're making your dinner, whatever it is, the duck dinner or any other dinner, you wanna put this in like with enough time in your head that it will brown. So that's at least 30 minutes to get a beautiful brown scallop thing. Now, once it's been in the fridge, you can improve your scallop also, because it firms up, obviously. This is a superb dish. I just laid an amazing tip on you guys. This is phenomenal. Dutch's potatoes, you can't go wrong. Come on, look! So they're gonna go in a pretty hot oven, 425, for about 30 minutes. Let's make broccoli rabe the easy way, which is a big secret, in the oven. It makes less mess, trust me. This should go in, you know, 25, 30 minutes. You should start this before you're gonna serve. So there is some timing issue involved, all right? But because we're not using the stove top, which makes a big mess, we're gonna use the oven. This is a secret, okay? You're gonna put olive oil in the pan like this. You're gonna put shallots in the bottom like this. It's really easy. And then you're gonna put your broccoli rabe. Now this is just rinsed broccoli rabe. Do not be alarmed at the amount. It will shrink. This is gonna roast, essentially. You, you don't want these big, thick, uh, rugged stalks. They can be very intense, all right? So you're basically gonna fill the pan. You're gonna put more olive oil on it. I remember the dinner party rule, right? If it tastes good raw, it's gonna taste good cooked. So you're gonna salt this. So you wanna make sure that this is edible raw, okay? You wanna kinda stir it around like this. And then you wanna taste a random piece. Tastes pretty good. I'm gonna put a little bit of lemon. With a duck dinner, you need this brightness, you know? Cause it's a very rich dinner. And a little lemon juice brightens up and makes the broccoli rabe even more piquant. And then I'm gonna put this in a 425 oven for like 25 minutes and it's gonna come out like I sauteed it without any sprays of grease and burnt pieces of broccoli rabe that got into the flame and all that stuff. It's a secret, but I'm telling you, it really works. And I have friends who request oven broccoli rabe. Eric loves that. My, he, he says, I want oven, oven greens, that's what he calls. Them. So here you go. Put this in your preheated oven. Just like that. And it's already cooking. So there you go. Amazing, easy and no mess. I'm gonna put a piece of tin foil on this um, only because I'm using convection because my oven is broken. So I have to use the convection setting. So I'm just gonna cover the rod loosely with this so that the edges of the leaves don't burn in the hot air. Just literally like that. So we're gonna make duck. And you know, ducks are living creatures. They're birds. So when you buy duck, buy it from a sustainable, humane farmer. You want a, a duck farm where the ducks run towards the farmer when he comes out, not away from the farmer. Believe me, there are tons of 
videos and websites of duck selling farms where they will show you videos of the ducks live CCTV, you know, of the ducks just wandering around. Could be fake, I don't know. But you just don't want to see ducks streaming away from any man that's walking. That's a bad sign. So the other thing about duck that's interesting, I wouldn't try to do this for more than four people. It gets a little hard to control it because it is sensitive meat, you know? So you want to, um, you want to keep this to a two to four meal. So this is duck. Um, I'm gonna trim it a little bit. I'm just gonna take this little kind of piece of fat off here. And this little piece of sinew sort of. Okay, and then what you wanna do is kind of make sure that the fat is covering the breast and not overlapping it. So you can see this is a pretty good fit but there's a little piece right here that's too big, so I'm just gonna go ahead and cut that off. You wanna use a very sharp knife. And there's a little tiny overhang at the bottom, so I'm just gonna slice that off. Now don't be scared of cooking duck. It's, um, it's not that hard. My, my mother used to say that duck should be passed through the oven, meaning duck should be served rare. So you want the, the skin fitting the top of the duck like that. And what we're gonna do is a sort of a variation on a Gordon Ramsay recipe. And we're gonna use these amazing things called Szechuan peppercorns. What they are, if you've ever had Chinese food that numbs your tongue slightly on the side, it's not that it burns your tongue, but it, it has a, do you know what I mean? Anybody have ever have that? It's like a numbing sensation. That's what this is. Now, it's um, Szechuan cooking. I went to Chengdu where they have the panda concentration camp. It, that's what it looks like. It's so depressing, I can't even tell you, but it is a panda research station. And I went to this Chinese restaurant, it's the best Chinese food I've ever had in my life, and it was Szechuan, and they had a big Lazy Susan, and we all ordered this food. It was the spiciest Chinese food I've ever had. I've never eaten anything that amazing in my life. So we're gonna use a little bit of Szechuan peppercorns. You wanna see a dorky chef thing? I have more than pestle. I'm grinding my herbs and spices. Okay, you're gonna use it maybe two times. All right, other than that, it's just to have, you know, anybody who has a really big one, unless they're making guacamole or whatever that thing is called, it's a sign that there's, in my opinion, it means they're not really a cook. But anyway, there's this, and then there's also this, which is a spice grinder, believe it or not. So it's very awesome, this thing. You hold, um, you can store spice in the top, and then you use it to grind spice in the bottom with this grindy thing. It's extremely rad. I'm gonna put just a little bit of Szechuan in there. Not too much, because it's only one little duck piece, so like maybe that much. Then I'm gonna grind it. Grind in the Szechuan pepper. And then it's like this consistency, wow. It's like ground pepper. Things about duck that are important. Duck is a water bird, okay, so it swims. Remember, it's a living animal before it was killed. In between its skin and the flesh, there's a thick layer of fat. That's why the duck floats. So you don't wanna serve duck with a big unrendered sheet of fat. You wanna render that fat down. That's the secret to crispy duck skin. So the first thing you wanna do is make it easier for it to render, which is to score the skin of the duck. Don't cut down to the meat. You know, it's a little bit of skill. If you hit the meat, it's not the end of the world, So the actress to the bishop. So you're gonna make a cut like that. See, it's in the fat only. Cut like that. And then I'm gonna turn it and make a diamond pattern like this. Now you'll be surprised how much fat comes out of this. And I'm gonna give you, you know, some real tips on how to cook this. And I'm, I'm gonna, I've, I have messed it up, just so you know. I mean, I've messed up duck. So I'm gonna take the Szechuan peppercorns and I'm gonna press them in to the duck like this. These are quite strong. All right, so I'm gonna press them in like that. A Little bit of salt, a little bit of salt. Then I'm gonna turn it. I'm gonna salt the back, okay? Peppercorns, and then I'm gonna sort of mop up what I did with the sides 
you know, and clean, sort of clean your prep area with your duck. And there's your duck and your little pieces of duck fat that you're gonna use, don't throw them away. And you're ready to proceed to the stove tap. We're gonna put it in a sort of low heat pan to render it down just a little bit, all right? To let it start rendering, I mean. So here we go. Now, it didn't make any noise, and that's okay. It's gonna start to render, and you're gonna be amazed at how much liquid comes out. So here's the thing. If you put it in a super hot pan, the outside layer is gonna burn or crisp before you've rendered the fat. So you wanna keep it in sort of a just around this temperature, and you can see already how much fat has run out of it. Let it do this for like a few minutes and render, render, render. Then you can turn it up and really sear it. Now duck fat is the most incredible thing to fry potatoes in. It's a luxurious and beautiful fat. Um, it's so don't throw it away. <laughs> These are also rendering right down. And it's, now it's really releasing fat. I'm also looking at the side and I'm looking at it go down. This white line is getting smaller. For the dinner in its entirety, your broccoli rabe and your, certainly your potatoes and your broccoli rabe should be going in at some point during this process. This, this cooks at a slightly higher heat, you'll figure it out, but your, your potatoes and your, your greens should be in because this only takes about 20 minutes. All right, I'm liking the way this is looking. I don't know if you can see how much, look at that. How much fat came out, it's amazing, okay? Or to me it is. And these are getting smaller, ooh, they're disappearing. Okay, now I'm gonna sear it, which means I'm gonna turn up the heat. Here we go. So this is actually my duck repeat from a disaster dinner. So please, please, please let it work out. <laughs> I think it will. Okay, here we go, it's searing up beautifully. I'm about to flip it and sear it on all the sides. This is blazing hot. This is a lovely little lodge pan. I think it's such a beautiful design. It's not Conrad, of course. You can now see copious amounts of liquid, which is fat. I'm now gonna flip it and just sear it a little bit on the other sides. It's beautifully brown and lovely. It's searing in its own fat. So really what I'm doing is just coloring it on all the sides, okay? I'm gonna put it on the side to sear the side. See what I'm doing? I'm sort of pressing it against the side. And then I might even do this to get the bottoms. All right, here we go, I'm flipping this. So we're gonna cook it on this side. We're gonna cook it um, skin side down, okay? So right before we put it in the oven, it's gonna continue to render. I'm gonna throw in some thyme, just loose thyme like this. Oh! Oh my goodness. And I'm gonna throw in a shallot, which I'm actually gonna crush with my hand a little bit. I'm just gonna throw it in like this, okay? And I'm gonna sort of dust it with that stuff, all right? So it's a Gordon thing, it's actually, it works. I don't know how it works, but it does work. So you kind of go like this with it, sort of. I think I have a, yeah, I have like a garlic clove in the, it's bit, not even really peeled. You can just kind of mush that with your finger and throw that in. All right, and now we're gonna put it in the oven. We're gonna put the pieces of duck fat on top of it. We're gonna put these on top of it and then put the thyme there. And that's all gonna just unctuously roll down into it while it cooks for about eight minutes. So I'm opening my oven and I'm taking it over here. There it goes. You know, it should be rare. Um, if it's cooked all the way through, it's okay, but it should be a little rare. Or as my mother said, as I told you, it should be simply spoken to about the oven or passed through the oven. That's what my mother would say, which I th thought was so cute. So there it is, about eight minutes. So here's the secret. The duck should rest as long as it cooked. Now, a lot of people don't do this. You have to rest steak, chicken, like we always say, if you've ever carved something and it shreds, it's because it's not rested. Resting it is almost as important as cooking it. So here we go. Just 
going to take it out with all its little coverings. I'm going to set it right there. What a beauty. If I tented it tightly, it would uh, continue to cook, not just rest. So I'm just going to go like this so it doesn't get cold. And I'm going to rest it for about eight minutes. And that's duck. And you can serve it with your gorgeous blackberry and cherry sauce that you made, your gastrique, um, that will just perfectly complement the beautiful richness of the duck. So there you go, duck dinner. Can't go wrong. All right, here they come. Look at that. Appreciate it. That's amazing. And you can't, I don't know if you can tell, but it's souffléed around the edges. Anyway, it's a perfect dish for friends. And in fact, I guess you could make, if you, you could bring this to a party and just reheat it, but I would bring it like this and then reheat it. It's superb. I cannot speak more highly of Dutch's potatoes. Click, click, click went the tongs. Clang, clang, clang went the bell. Zing, zing, zing went my heart strings when the broccoli rub was done and many more. I'm gonna take this out. No mess and it's exactly as if you had made it on the stove, except it's slightly crispy, which is even better. Oh yeah. Broccoli Rob, frankly, I would eat this entire plate right now, but they'll yell at me because they need it for beauty shots. <laughs> but this is delicious. As you know, I'm a wino. I mean, I enjoy wine. Uh, so I serve wine. However, people like to have cocktails sometimes. The problem with cocktails is that it takes you away from what you're doing in the kitchen. So you either have to have somebody who is uh, doing your cocktails for you, or you have to do batch cocktails. So we're gonna talk about batch martinis. So what you wanna do is make a lot in advance. Now, any drink that doesn't have fruit juice, you can do this with. Martini, Manhattan doesn't have juice, I don't know. Anything that doesn't have juice, you can mix it in advance and just pour them out at, at will. So let's make some martinis with Tito's vodka. Something I find bizarre is that Americans like to have a drink called chilled vodka in a glass, and they call it a martini. A martini is a cocktail. It has other ingredients besides cold vodka. If you just want chilled vodka in a 10 ounce glass, just ask for that. But a martini has vermouth. Now this is Noili Pratt, that's how you say it. Noili Pratt makes vermouth. I happen to love vermouth. I'm one of the last remaining human beings who actually drinks vermouth on the rocks. Just a little vermouth, as Paul's grandmother would say. For the tooth, for the toothache. This is 10 years from the grape to the bottle, let alone how long it rests in the bottle. They're, they're a, an amazing company. You should look them up. There's a great documentary about them. Mm, I love vermouth. So you want to dry vermouth and your Tito's. Now, it's really two and a half to one. So we're gonna guesstimate this, and we're gonna do it by taste, all right? So we're just gonna pour a little vodka in here. Oh dear, my crew is gonna be a, a disaster. Here you go. So I have this much vodka. Now I left space in case I mess it up. Now we've talked about this before, but you know how James Bond says, shaken, not stirred? That's because of, of martini is always stirred because it has no juice. He's specifying he wants his martini different. A lot of people like shaken because it has those beautiful shards of ice in it. It's delicious. I'm just gonna stir this. It's totally delicious. I'm gonna put a little more of this in. Now, how many martinis is that? It's a lot. I'm chilling my glasses before the party, okay? This shape, that's ice. This shape is called a Nick and Nora. Buy these, they're so cute. And they're very retro sort of glass to, um, to serve a martini in. I'm just trying this now. See how it's colored by the vermouth? That's a martini. <clears throat> now, look what you have. You have champagne, you have wine for the winos, 
and then you have a mix, a batch martini. You can even do it, leave it like that, sort of cute. Then when you take it out of the fridge, you go like this and you pour them their drink. I'm gonna actually chill this for a little bit and we'll come back to serving these. You also might wanna bring out the peanuts while you know, you, your guests are coming in. You can serve dry roasted salted peanuts. You can go back to any of our appetizer episodes and pick something out. Salty peanuts are, I'm sure you guys know this, are good if people are drinking. It's a lovely combo of the warmth of the alcohol and the salty, salty peanuts. So I'm just gonna go ahead and just have a little tasty poo. And you can use, of course, um, twist, which are hard to do, but you can figure it out. They're, they're, I, they're hard. Olive, spicy olive, slice of jalapeno. Really, you can put anything in here you want. So I'm gonna try this. See how it's pale, pale, beautiful color? That's a martini. That's uh, delicious. It's totally delicious. Here, try that, Nikki. It's a little warm, but it's, that's, that's the correct ratio. Oh yeah. Taste the smoothness of the vermouth. It's better than the way I made it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. All right, I'm gonna chill this and we'll come back to service in a little bit. Let's try and make a weirdo cocktail, okay? I love James Bond. I'm not a James Bond freak at, at all, but I, I, I love a good James Bond movie. I like Sean Connery and Daniel Craig. I mean, come on. <laughs> so we're gonna make a James Bond drink. The martini is, of course, made famous by James Bond. The vodka martini was made famous by him. Well, I guess the historical martini is gin. But anyway, James Bond in Casino Royale, Lynn wrote this down, I can't believe this, in 1953, like I could have pretended like I knew that, but Lynn wrote it down. The 1953 Casino Royale, he orders um, a drink named after his nemesis, Vesper. You remember Vesper? So the drink he orders is very strange. Gin, vodka, and Lillet. Now this is not Lillet, it's gorgeous though, but any sort of light colored Amaro. Let's, let's try to do this. It's apparently three parts gin, so we're gonna try to do this, and we're gonna taste it, we're gonna do a taste test, everybody, okay? One. Parts just means amount. Oh, sorry. So when, you, when you're looking at a recipe and it says three parts to two parts, and you're like, what's a part? What's a part? Well, a part just means whatever you're using to measure. Two of those to one of this. That's all that means. Three parts gin. The problem with gin, oh, when I was a little kid, I had a dirty book. Boys don't know what dirty books are because they only look at dirty pictures, okay? But girls look at dirty books. So I had this dirty book called Blue Skies No Candy, and it drove me nuts, this book, when I was probably 13, and they drank gin in the book. So I said, when I'm allowed to drink, I'm only gonna drink gin and tonic, right? And I realized after a short time, first of all, I can't uh, tolerate, it's too high alcohol, and number two, gin makes you crazy. But anyway, the character in Blue Skies No Candy, oh my God, has anybody else in planet internet ever read this book, Blue Skies No Candy? It was fabulous. So it's three parts gin to one part vodka. It seems like a very bizarre drink to me. And then a little bit of this, right? Half a part, so. I don't know, it might be delicious. You never know. This is the kind of thing you don't wanna do when your guests are here, right? You don't wanna be doing like, just a minute. Oh, this duck is burning. You know, like you don't wanna be doing that. I don't know if he wants it this color, but I know Lille is this color, so it must be right. I'm gonna do something slightly sinful so that we can try it at its correct temperature. I'm actually gonna stir it with a little bit of ice, which you're not supposed to do unless it's in a shaker, but I'm just gonna do it real quick so we can chill it. The Vesper, isn't that chic? But let's see, let's see if it's good. The Vesper, oh, it's a pretty color. Guys, look at that. So I'm gonna try this. I'm not a gin fan because it makes me crazy, even though they did drink it in Blue Skies No Candy. This is an extraordinary drink. Hightow, I wanna to talk to you about Hightow, our second camera, Hightow, got a movie in major festivals where he was nominated for a Golden Lion or whatever it is, that's Berlin, but whatever it is, Golden Horse or? Golden Horse, this is a guy that we hang out with. So anyway, this is for Hightow. I, I usually hand it to Hightow, but I'm gonna hand it to Brian, who's second camera, because Hightow's so busy being, here, so busy being in, in the movies. I'm not gonna lie to you, it's a weird drink. It's good. <laughs> it's good. All right, so 
Vesper is a fun thing to, hang, to fool around with. I think the color is gorgeous. So that's a fun thing to do in your free time. It's just little special things. If somebody comes to your party and you say, I have red wine, white wine, champagne, and Vespers. And they say, oh, what's a Vesper? And you say, oh, it's from 1953. You know, that's a beautiful sort of entertaining conversation starter. And that's part of sort of having an amusing, fun, interesting time with people, some strangers, some people you know. Have a Vesper. What's a Vesper? Oh, it's a James Bond. You know, things like that. You can have fun and they can have fun. And that's what it's all about, is entertaining and having people in your home. Please do it. Please invite your friends over. The other thing I was going to tell you is we're shooting this on November 29th. So too strong, Reggie? Reggie tried the Vesper. She didn't like it. Um, <laughs> she, you can set it down right there. All right. <laughs> too strong for Reggie. She didn't like it. She's more of a, a single malt drinker. We shot this, or we're shooting this on November 29th. When you see it, the Tyson Wilder fight will have been completed and we'll know who won. I have a weird feeling that Tyson Fury might win. It's unlikely, it's very unlikely, but I have a strange feeling Tyson Fury might win. Today we made batch martinis. When your friends come, you say, I have champagne, red wine, white wine, and blank, whatever your batch is. Don't let them choose. Then we made some quick pickled vegetables. These are the last of the summer veg in just a very quick pickle. And then we had a fantastic, nostalgic, retro canapé, Ritz crackers, with cheese, a little bit of mayonnaise, and hot pepper jelly. For our main course, we had Szechuan duck. It's a duck. We seared that and oh, it was lovely and we put garlic and all this stuff on it. And then our sides were duchess potatoes, delicious, fluffy, souffléed. We had broccoli wrap cooked in the oven. It's a secret. And then for dessert, lace cookies. Really, you could use anything with these. You could serve them simply with coffee or you could stick them in ice cream, lace cookies. Disasters are crushing and they're crushing to me they're crushing to everybody who watches it. I'm talking about kitchen disasters. They're crushing. And I, I repeat that the only way out of it is to cook again. So if you have to throw something out or take it off somebody's plate, cook the next day or the day after. The only way you can get out of it is to cook again. And always take the risk. Invite people over. If it messes up, it messes up. And you might be crushed, it's okay. So invite people over because you may not be crushed and the crushing might be an amazing experience or learning experience for you. Or they may have a blast. You may be, everything may come out perfectly. So the only thing that we want to say here basically at dinner party tonight is, let me get Leonard, take a risk, be scared, invite your friends over. You can't mess up if you come from a place of love and wanting to give people a, an amusing evening. That's all you're doing. Have your friends over. Invite their dogs, if they're well behaved. Go back and look at some of our old ep episodes for holiday food, creamed leeks, Christmas cake, um, uh, hundreds of them that are up there on the shorts. And we cannot thank you enough for watching the show. You don't know what it means to us that you guys take the time to comment and the time to watch us and to appreciate and try recipes and invite your friends over from watching the show. It makes me feel like a million bucks and it makes the crew feel great. And thank you guys so much from Leonard who is now recovered from Thanksgiving. Seems fine. And from everybody at dinner party tonight, happy holidays. Duck. It's a duck.